time to begin building a graphic system into this code base. Now, first of all, this topic is huge. Even just in the one video, I probably couldn't lay out a full description of everything we could explore in the topic of graphics programming. So in this arc, we're only going to get through a little bit of the entire breadth of the topic. And before we start programming, I want to lay out how I think about lots of the details in this topic, and then also explain how I'm going to organize the process of going from having no code to having the system that I want. So let's start by talking about sort of a tech tree of all the things we could build as graphic systems. First of all, there's a selection of graphics APIs. And by that, I mean things like OpenGL, D3D, Vulkan, Metal, etc. These are APIs that you use with graphics because they communicate with the GPU, sending data down to the GPU, sending commands to the GPU. You could technically do graphics without using a GPU, but even then you'd have to make that as a decision and you'd write totally different code that would implement all of the different data transformations you want to do on the CPU. So one way or another, you have to decide where the data transformations are going to happen and how you're going to transfer those data transformations to another device like a GPU if it's not just happening on the CPU. And that's what this first decision is all about. Second, you have to decide what operating system you're writing for. And the reason for that is in pretty much any operating system, there is going to be specific things about how graphics end up being shown to the user that that operating system controls. So these obviously are things like Win32, Linux, and Mac, but also the web and mobile are sort of examples of either operating systems or types of operating systems that you would need to decide you're targeting. And once you've decided which one you're targeting, then you can build an operating system layer that includes a graphics subsystem, which will include information like how do I go about setting up a window where the user can actually see things on the screen. The choice of operating system also influences how you initialize the graphics API because the operating system, or in the case of web, for instance, the layer that sort of emulates an operating system, controls the communication to all the other devices. Other devices that are connected to your computer are like resources, just like memory and time. And so the operating system actually has to be the one that decides how those resources get used and how to hand them out to user programs. Therefore, in, before you can even start using a graphics API, you have to use the operating system to sort of initialize that API, get access to it in some way or another. A third category of decision we need to consider is what style of graphics we're doing, right? You could be doing graphics that are sort of 2D tool type graphics. So you want to be able to show text on the screen a lot, lots of flat rectangles and simple shapes, lots of icons. Uh, you might want to be doing a 2D game. So a lot more sprites and scaling things, maybe a little bit more complex shaders or a 2D vector art thing. So curves and anti-aliasing and things like that. You might be doing a 3D game or 3D modeling tool. All these different things have different needs for what kind of graphics primitives get implemented in your renderer. And instead of trying to literally implement the most abstract possible interface of our own that basically encapsulates the entire possibility range of all other graphics APIs, I think it's a lot more useful to pick a particular style, decide what features you're going to support, and just support them. And use that layer as your abstraction. So for instance, if we pick the 2D tool style, which is what I intend to get started with, then we'll focus on you, you know drawing text, drawing simple shapes, drawing icons, and not a lot else. That'll be something we can implement pretty easily in lots of different APIs. And we won't have to then figure out how we're going to abstract over fairly different aspects of these systems. We won't, for instance, have to figure out how to make a single shared shader language that can compile to all of them because we probably just need one, maybe two or three shaders maximum for any given API to implement all the features we want to have. And so those can just sort of be hand rolled once and then sh they should be good to go. To put it another way, the style acts as the boundary between applications and the graphics code. So for instance, if we're going to end up making several different tools in this code base, we wouldn't want to have to write brand new graphics code from scratch that opens a window and initializes OpenGL or Direct3D or whatever else every time we make a new tool. Instead, what we would want is that whenever we go to make a new tool, we can just reuse the existing graphics system that was already used in previous similar tools. Now, when we pick one of each of these things, so we pick an API, like 
Direct3D or OpenGL, we pick an operating system like Win32, and we pick a style, then we have one discrete problem that is completely concrete, except for the fact that it's abstracted from the actual application, right? So we can, for instance, sit down and directly write to the Windows API and tell it to create Windows, tell it to initialize OpenGL, and then tell the OpenGL API to render the text and the shapes that we want for a 2D tool, bundle all that into one package and call that our Win32 OpenGL 2D tool system. And then later, if we write multiple applications to 2D tool, that'll be great. But we'll run into another problem, which is that's completely concrete so that there's no boundaries within that system the way I've described it so far. So if we end up wanting to do a D3D version and an OpenGL version, there's going to be some amount of the Win32 code that would have actually been the same between both of those that now gets copied and pasted around because we don't have an organizational plan to take into account the fact that some of the Win32 graphics stuff is graphics API independent and some of it is directly about initializing the graphics API. Similarly, if we go to implement a Linux OpenGL backend for the 2D tool API, we wouldn't want to have to duplicate all of the OpenGL code either. We would want a boundary there so that all of the OpenGL code that is not operating system specific can be reused on different operating systems. But the part of the OpenGL code that is operating specific because that's how we initialize the OpenGL, we want that to be written in different ways for different operating systems. Now, no doubt getting something like this right is extremely difficult. One, you have to be able to recognize whenever a piece of code could be able to be shared in multiple places. And two, even when you recognize that something can be shared, that doesn't mean that it's obvious how you can share it without incurring some kind of penalty. Sometimes the penalty is a performance penalty. Sometimes it's massively more complicated when you share it. And making the judgment call about when it's going to be too complicated to not share something versus when it's going to be too complicated to choose to share something, or making the judgment call about when the performance penalty is too high to be worth the abstraction, all of those are very difficult things that can only really be worked out by iterations and looking at examples. So the way we're going to proceed is, first of all, very carefully. And we're going to use a method that I tend to find is my favorite way to deal with this, which is to start very, very concrete. We're going to pick the easiest triple for me to get started with, which is Win32 OpenGL 2D tool. We're going to start working on building that thing concretely. And so that means no abstractions, no extra functions, no turning it into a library. Just literally, we're going to start with the simplest example program that gets Win32 OpenGL context up and running with a graphical window that we can see. And then from there, we will try to add in some abstraction. And then what we'll do is we will ping pong back and forth, adding in more constraints on either side of the abstraction. So the two sides of the abstraction are on one side, we need implementers. So for instance, if we have a Win32 OpenGL 2D tool, we might throw in Win32 D3D 2D tool in a little bit so that we can figure out when certain functions that look like they could be shared are actually better to not share because they're too different after all. Or when things that didn't obviously seem like they were shareable turn out to actually just be Win32 or totally generic functions, we can pull them out to more shareable spots in the code. So we'll need two examples of backends to do that, which is why we might throw in D3D. And then at the same time, we probably want a couple of examples of real tools at least sketched out so that we can see that it's actually useful to use this API for several different things. On either side of the equation, we don't want it to be too hard to implement this API with new backends, and we don't want it to be too hard to use this API to get useful tools built. So just having one example of either one might cause us to overfit in one direction or the other. Now, this is a lot of work because it means we need to build up several examples of things on either side of this API, which means we need at least sort of four different projects all going at once. It's a lot to keep track of, and along the way we'll be put, tugged and pulled in different directions as we try to make all the different details work. But hopefully along the way we start to settle on an API that actually does abstract this well, and I, I tend to find that starting very concretely with a couple of examples on each side of the API and then iterating on the abstraction a little bit that leads to APIs that just slot in very nicely when more things come along because they're not overfit to one example. They are sort of spread across several different realistic examples. And at the same time, they didn't start off abstract, so they're not completely invented. They started off concrete and only added in penalties for abstraction when it was absolutely necessary to make things work together. Otherwise, if we started with the abstraction and then filled in concrete details, I tend to find that we would have weird, bizarre mismatches between the abstraction and what we actually needed. 
good. So I like to start off very concrete, start with multiple examples, and then go back and forth between building more concrete parts and then abstracting them back and forth until everything feels like it's fitting together. So that's the plan of how we're going to proceed. We'll get started on the next video.